G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. We're looking at a shot of uh, 453 Squadron Royal Australian Air Force at Sanji Patani in Malaya in 1941 in December. And they're sitting in borrowed Royal Air Force Brewster Buffalo Mark 1s. The Brewster Buffalo was possibly the worst fighter aircraft of all time. It was definitely the worst fighter aircraft of World War II in the Pacific. As you can see, the official history claims that the Royal Australian Air Force only ever owned 17 Brewster Buffaloes, but it does admit that as well as the 17 Buffaloes on strength with the RAAF in Australia, many other examples were flown in Malaya on loan from the RAF. The Buffaloes proved to be no match for the superior Japanese fighter aircraft of the period. This book also gives the power as a 1,200 horsepower Wright Cyclone was actually a 600 horsepower in the Mark I that the Australians were flying. I'm going to take our instruction from War Without Glory by J.D. Balfe, who says, My title for the book initially was How Odd of God, reflecting the shock that Australian squadrons felt at the defeat they initially suffered and their pilots' bitter bewilderment that a single nation had been able to sweep unaided through Southeast Asia's vast area. Japan had captured it entirely in nearly half the Western Pacific. Higher trained, longer experienced, number 21 squadron was the more formidable of the two fighter units. A corps of well-chosen pilots gave the squadron its punch. They were permanent Air Force men selected to pre-war standards and cadet course trained at the RAAF's main flying academy, Point Cook, Victoria. John Congo Kinnemont, Fred Williams, Dick McKenney, Harold Montefiore were all typical of the RAAF's best pilots. There were others. Each had packed 600 fighter flying hours into their logs. Combat was the only experience awaiting them. The Buffaloes recast the flying of both fighter squadrons and the entire air roll of number 21 squadron. Pilots had to retrain while the new ones arrived with very little operational training at all. They even had to be taught the basic aerobatics, spin recovery and other essentials before they could handle the first Wiraways and after them the Buffaloes. They had not had instrument flying training and knew nothing of tropical weather, which all amounted to a major handicap. Fred Williams recalled, we, were trained hard, we retrained hard, revising and testing out fighter tactics with the buffaloes for ourselves. We used shadow gunnery for mock attacks, a new idea developed by Middle East squadrons in which the attacker dives on another aircraft's shadow on the water. Number 21 Squadron won its new operational status a month before Japan invaded. Number 453 Squadron a little later. From the beginning, they found that the Buffalo, built like one and looking like one with its humped canopy, was a beast of rogue Buffalo habits. Some of them were disastrous. Grease used to inhibit and preserve the bullets vaporised when the two guns built into the aircraft's nose were fired between the airscrew blades. The vapour sprayed the pilot's windshield and blanked it out almost completely. This was alarming for in combat the pilot would be blind. The buffaloes could not be flown at night. They had short stub exhausts which flashed blue glare close in front of the pilot. This dazzled him and impaired his night vision at critical times as in takeoffs, landings or combat. The fighter's ceiling, the height to which it could climb, was rated almost to match that of the Zeros, which still had plenty of fight in them at 18,000 feet or 5,500 metres, but above 16,000 feet, 4,800 metres, the Buffalo's 600 horsepower engine, not 1,200 as it mentioned in the previous book, starved for fuel as the engine pump could not keep up enough fuel pressure. The pilot could go on climbing only by hand pumping fuel. He would then have to fly his aircraft, pump fuel, fight and fire his guns, all four things at once with only two hands, a fatal combination. The Buffalo's great weight was an equally serious fighting problem. It simply did not have the needed performance. Its engine was underpowered, the aeroplane was sloppy in a steep combat turn and very likely to stall out of its pilot's hands. At the same time, the built-in radio was high frequency so that tropical static drowned it out. The squadron finally threw it out to save weight, and as a last-ditch measure, they also discarded all of the pilot's steel plate armour, except the back plate, 
and other encumbrances that save between them 1,200 pounds or 500 kilograms half a tonne. It was a help, but the pilots realised it would not be enough. Nothing flying then could match the featherweight, high-flying, fast and manoeuvrable zero. Range would be another problem. The buffaloes could fly out to a maximum 200 miles, 320 kilometres radius, fight and get back. Beyond that distance, its tanks had been burned so low that they had dangerously little fuel left for combat, always flown on full throttle and for the return home. The fuel gauge added to the trouble, a hydrostatic type unsuited to the cell structure of the fuel tanks. The gauge gave the pilot no real indication of his remaining fuel and consumption varied enormously according to engine demand. Pilots had to nurse their engines with utmost care. Hit and run was what the Australians would be reduced to, with more run in it than hit. But while their buffaloes might not match up, Australian pilots needed bow to no one when it came to guts and tenacity. Here we see a map of Japan's attack on the 7th and 8th of December 1941 with the buffaloes over here at Sanji Patani and Singapore Island where they would come up against zeros. The original zero, the Mitsubishi quote nought, which the Allied codenamed Zeke followed the Type 96. Zeke had 2,000 kilometres still air range with 120 kilograms of bombs. It had 3,000 kilometres range with full tanks and no bombs. It flew at 530 kilometres per hour at 4,800 metres and its ceiling was stated at 14,000 metres. The Buffalo's comparisons were 1440 kilometres range, 474 kilometres per hour, and 9144 metres ceiling, apart from its further weaknesses in combat performance. By one of fate's cruel ironies, the father of the Zeros was designed with British technical help. In mid 1930s, Japan formed a joint Navy Army Imperial University Aviation Institute, which set out to produce a breakthrough fighter type. It engaged the design services of the British Sopwith Company's Herbert Smith, widely applauded as the designer of the famed World War I Sopwith Camel Fighter. With Smith's help and that of a project team, the Institute took less than a year to design, build, and test fly the fighter that it sought. It typed it the A5M, the Zero's parent type, and was a breakaway from the former biplane fighters into low wing monoplane design. The 21 squadron pilots were at least aware of the Buffalo's good points and had learned its shortcomings, so that the basic question was how good were the good points? Time would tell. The technicians were working on the faults. The pilot was well armoured and the aircraft was immensely strong. It could chase anything down and should fight usefully at low heights, like against a fleeing adversary or an aircraft strafing. It got off the ground quickly and had a fast initial rate of climb. That would help in a scramble. Up high was where the major problem occurred. Although the Buffalo was credited with 470 kilometres per hour top speed at 5,500 metres or 18,000 feet, the pilots found that their speed there trued out at nearer to 430. Time disclosed that the Zeros confronting them had top speeds around 560 kilometres per hour and twice the Buffalo's performance at 6,000 metres, where it was like a fledgling to a hawk. Describing action over Singapore on the 8th of December. The two airborne pilots poured every ounce of power they could into their engines in a desperate effort to climb to the bomber's height and close with them before they made off. But the Buffaloes could not reach the height in time. Then to both pilots' chagrin, neither could make their guns fire when they pressed the firing buttons to warm them. Flight Lieutenants Kirkman and Hooper had to land again disappointed and cursing the gun mounts. At least by their attempt they had saved their aircraft. The 0.5 inch gun mounts now represent presented a critical problem. The Buffalo had two guns firing from the wings, two through the airscrew, but it was mainly the wing gun mounts that were fracturing. Fred Williams recalls, finally, the only way we could get over the trouble was to replace the .5s with .303 calibre guns. We did that with the engineering facilities we had down on Singapore Island, but even then we couldn't win. We got our first issue of buffaloes in a good shape only to have them reissued to fly in Burma.
so we lost them for another assignment of unmodified buffaloes. But not only that, we were ordered immediately to Sanji Patani without doing the modifications. These aircraft were now the problem. If we could not depend on our guns, we were in real trouble. Up there in the north, we had to use Penang engineering firm's workshops. They were simply not capable of doing the work. Our unhappy armourers never did get the guns serviceable, although their efforts were admirable. An account by Flight Lieutenant J.R. Kinnemont, later Wing Commander DSODFC. The sky seemed full of red circles, the red rondelles on Japanese aircraft, and the Japs all tried to shoot us down at once. I pulled up to meet one as he dived down. I was in such a hurry to shoot something that I didn't even use my gun sight. I simply sprayed bullets in his general direction. <clears throat> Somebody was on my tail, and tracers were whipping past my wings. Chapman was turning and shooting with four Japs, so I decided to get out. I yelled to him over the radio, return to base, return to base. I went into a vertical dive, and as I went down, glimpsed the sergeant diving straight for the ground. Three Japs on his tail, shooting. Then I lost sight of him. At a, a thousand metres, I had a quick shot at a four-engine Kawanishi Jap flying boat and missed. Of the three Japs that followed us down in that dive, one stuck and he stuck like a leech. As I watched him, my neck screwed around. I saw his gun smoke and I whipped into a tight turn to the left. It was too late. A burst of his bullets spattered into the buffalo. I opened the throttle and the motor took it without a murmur. That was then that I first felt real fear in my life. It struck me in a flash. This Jap was out to kill me. I broke into a cold sweat and it ran down into my eyes. A noise throbbed in my head and I suddenly felt loose and weak. My feet kept jumping on the rudder pedals. My mouth was stone dry, I couldn't swallow. My mouth was open and I was panting as though I had just finished a hundred yards dash. I felt cold. Then I was gibbering. Watch those trees. That was close. He'll get you with the next burst. You'll flame into the trees. No, he can't get you. Jesus, he mustn't get you. You're too smart. He'll get you next time. Watch him. Watch those trees. Christ, it's cold. My feet were still jumping on the pedals. I couldn't control them. Then I saw his attacks were missing me. I was watching his guns. Each time they smoked, I slammed into a right turn. And then my whole body tightened up and I could think. I flew low and straight, only turning in when he attacked. The Jap couldn't hit me again. We raced down a valley into the Thai border and he quit. An account by Flight Lieutenant Fred Williams on the 8th of December. 1941, when four buffaloes attempted to find some Blenheims and escort a bombing raid. We were jumped by a horde of zeros and the shooting began both ways. The weather and static were so severe that our radios were only working after a fashion. The grease on the bullets of my .5s firing through the airscrew had vaporised and come back over the windshield. It made it almost impossible for me to see ahead. I fastened onto one aircraft that I thought was a zero and fired a short burst. I nearly shot down Dick McKenney. We had taken off together, were furiously engaged, murderously outnumbered, and fighting as much to save our own lives as to shoot down anyone else. Hey, Fred, lay off. It's me, Dick. Thank heaven the radio had worked for once. It was all a mix-up. There were so many. We were firing blindly and trying to get away. At last we did break off, and Dick and I got back to the aerodrome at Butterworth. We were practically out of fuel on landing and more than an hour after more than an hour and a half in the air. We land, so we landed. It was 5 p.m. White and Monte Fiore were still flying. Two formations of Japs had just gone over the airfield before we arrived and had bombed and strafed it. We knew we had to get back at them. There was a petrol tank at tanker near the strip. McKenney and I went straight over to get fuel from it, but found it only that some conscientious person in awe of Air Force orders had padlocked its hoses. Everyone was in the slit trenches. Who on earth had the key? We were stymied. But we could see the Japs coming back, 27 bombers and 27 fighters in formation. Without wasting any more time or thought on fuel, we took off again and climbed for the formations on rated power. Dick and I had little way of knowing how much fuel we had, but we were in no doubt that on flying time alone it was precious little. The best we knew was that our tanks were self-sealing. Even if they had been holed, they would not have leaked. But our fuel gauges were useless. There was no way of being sure just how we stood. So I'm sure you've got uh, a pretty good idea of the flavour of how this turned into this. A Brewster Buffalo abandoned at its dispersal and captured by the Japanese. This is the only fighter aircraft in the world that ever had two kinds of guns. One kind for shooting out through the propeller, which would cover the pilot's windscreen in 
corrosion preventative grease because it was designed as a naval carrier fighter and therefore it had to be rust proof. And another kind of gun in the wings, which broke the engine mounts, the gun moved backwards, still continued to fire free, fired through the front wing spars and shot the wing off. Strangely, in Finnish hands against the Russians, they had great success, but I guess they probably had the 1200 horsepower engine variety, not the 600 horsepower engine variety, and they didn't have cosmoline grease all over their ammunition. The Brewster Buffalo, world's worst fighter aircraft ever. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.